be talking about these issues as they tour Israel. And they're going to have policy experts throughout. And if you're interested in, in, in learning more about that trip, I would encourage you to go to securefreedom.org or religiousfreedomcoalition.org. It's also being uh, put, put together by William Murray of the Religious Freedom Coalition and uh, Bill Federer of the American Minute. Many of you probably know him. So one of the things before I turn it over to this outstanding panel, which is really they're going to banter back and forth for the next 15 minutes asking each other questions because they know the issues. Um, one of the things that I didn't say in the introduction is the two in the center, um, they were instrumental. I think Hank mentioned Ronald Reagan, and I know Frank mentioned Ronald Reagan at the end, and his vision. Well, they served in his administration, and I should have said that in the beginning. Frank served as the Deputy Secretary of Defense for National Security, <laughs> assistant, and, uh, and Hank Cooper <laughs> served as the Chief Negotiator with the Soviets in Geneva. And so they played an instrumental role in defeating an evil empire. And, and I wanted to say that because if we did it once, we can do it again. So with the right vision. So I'm going to ask a question. And, and, and what I want to do is if you would each just go through and ask, answer the question. And then, then Frank is going to moderate this, uh, this panel. So we're all here. And we have, I think, hundreds of people right now watching on the internet. And we're angry. And, and we're, we're infuriated. I don't know what the right word is. Um, probably something that shouldn't be said on the internet. Um, <laughs> what do we do? Put us to work. What do we do? Um, <clears throat> first of all, I think we need to go with Frank to Israel. I'm going to go with you, OK? OK. Yeah, I was going anyway with him. So, uh, <laughs> so we invite all of you to come. But I think uh, in terms of what do we do, what I typically say, I run an activism organization. And uh, people say, well, what, what can I do? And almost like what Ben said, you know, just go do it. My question is, how many hours per week can you commit right now to actively doing something. And that cuts 90% of the people, why well, I don't really have any time and all of that. Uh, so it, it's important to remember 236 years and 17 days ago, there were 2,000 uh, American troops, but only about 20% <laughs> had their fight, their head in the fight. You know, the rest were there. It doesn't take everybody to make a difference. Just a small group is needed. And hook up with an organization, Act for America, the United West, that has a specific training program to utilize your capability to find the place in the fight where you fit. So you go to boot camp first by finding the right organization to train you based upon the amount of time you have. And we take a very analytical, dispassionate, sort of a military approach to getting people into the fight. You want to fight, there's something to do with your skill level, whether it's on the computer at home, or whether it's confronting the bad guys in the street in an ideological fashion. Just get ready. Oh, you're the only one. We've, we've got one or oh. two here. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough uh, the point that, uh, that several have made, and most especially Tom just. When you look at great, even historically momentous, course corrections. The founding of this republic comes to mind as one. It's usually a trivially small number of people who make that happen. They have to know what they're doing. They have to be well led. They have to be disciplined. They have to, in the uh, words of the people who put this together, be prepared to give their sacred honor to get it done. But if you're willing to do that, you can make a difference. Uh, Tom has mentioned a couple of organizations that are working the problem, and, uh, and Brigitte Gabrielle's among them. Um, in our course that I mentioned several times, MuslimBrotherhoodInAmerica.com, the final part is about what you can do even as an individual all by yourself. Uh, it's not everything, but it's something. I mentioned several times, I think, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham has um, you in mind at the moment. That's something that should be exploited. He wants to hear from you for the next two years. 
Make sure he does. And I would just offer, in addition to the specific things that we're suggesting you do in the course, uh, that you look at, and this sounds maybe like it's inside baseball, but I, I really believe this is the kind of thing that can make a huge difference. If we could fight and defeat, ideally all three of these post-American, post-sovereignty, post-constitutional, some have said, managed American declinist nominees for the Department of State, John Kerry, the Department of Defense, Chuck Hagel, and the CIA, John Brennan. It would make a profound difference in the direction we're going. Not, not because there won't be somebody else coming along to replace them, maybe as bad, probably not, but because it would signal to both the American people, and to our president, that that's not the trajectory we want this country to go. And by avoiding it, or at least slowing the pace, changing the course even a little bit, we may well be able to save this republic. So I would just second the point. Don't kid yourself. I think you're here on a beautiful day, not just to hear us, but because you do want to know what you can do there are specific, practical, near-term things that as individuals, as members of groups like the Tea Parties, and as citizens, with a host of other citizens, that we can do, and frankly, we don't have any choice. We have to do if we want to save this republic. Uh, see, is this on? It's hard to add very much to what Frank said. Uh, one thing occurs to me, um, Scott mentioned we served with Reagan. I want to back up four years before then, which was uh, a period of malaise, according to Jimmy Carter, if you remember. And uh, some of us were engaged in the battle during those four years. I'm not sure we have four years now to, to deal with the issue before us. But I can tell you that the fight was just as uh, significant at the grassroots level, at least, that I was a party of. Uh, when Cyrus Vance, in the beginning of the um, Carter administration, went to Russia, to Moscow, and basically said he'd give away the farm for an arms control agreement, those of us who care about those sorts of issues got engaged. And we engaged with our friends that we knew and people that we didn't know work through various organizations to educate the various public and so on. Uh, Reagan was around, but he was not a big player until the latter days of the Car uh, Carter administration. And I, I, don't, I, I say that with all due respect to him. I, what I'm really saying is there was a movement among the people which changed Washington, ultimately. It was the Reagan Revolution. We did change things. We went a different direction, and we've lost our way again. Uh, I don't know that we have four years, frankly. Uh, I, I'm very concerned about, um, uh, about the threat that Frank has discussed with you, Sharia, uh, and the more active proponent of that, which uh, would do us harm in a flash if they could. And that's why I spent my time talking about EMP, because that's an obvious way to do it. And they know it. Then they practice to do it. If they get their hands on a nuclear weapon, I believe they'll do it. That's not, uh, I don't believe this is uh, heretical. I don't believe it's alarmist. I think it's reality. And so that means that things that you can do yourself, understand what this thing is about, this threat is about. Prepare your family. Prepare yourself. If it happens, it's not going to destroy you physically immediately. What's going to happen is you're going to starve to death. You're not going to get your insulin. You're not going to survive uh, very long before natural courses take, uh, natural events take their course. So in that case, there are things you can do as an individual. Inform your friends. Read Bill Fortune's book. It's one second after. He was this fellow who spoke on, on the, and it's a novel on the video that uh, Tom prepared um, about what happened in a little town in North Carolina in a, a fictional context. And prepare yourself. 
I mean, it doesn't take a genius to understand what would happen if that, ha if that occurred. And uh, we here in South Carolina in particular know how to live in an agrarian society still, and we should be prepared. Thank you. you know, one other uh, quick action step if you want to do something. We're going to be downstairs, the four of us. The three of us are authors, but hey, guys, can we let Ben sign the book too? What do you think? <laughs> All right? We'll let Ben sign it too. We have about 40 or 50. Read this book in the next seven days. It really is an amazing book. There's 19 authors. And watch that video, Obsession. Those two items will provide all the information you need to go forward fighting this threat, this Islamic Jihadi threat. I would, being amongst the, hello, is this loud enough? All right, being amongst these guys, it's like I gotta take notes even up here that I'm trying to speak and, <sighs> all right. They've used our freedoms against us. What can we do? Let's use our freedoms against them. Like I was saying, you take it. Don't. <laughs> Standing out in front of somebody, pointing at them and saying, this is what you believe. This is what you're going to do. This is where you came from. Let everybody else know. They'll start getting interest, like a kitten with a string. Shake it. Rattle it. Let them see it. Let them know what the heck is going on here. And people will start educating themselves. You know, as they'll stand on your front lawn and protest you. You have to do that back to them. It's a lefty strategy, and we're disinterested in government. We're just now getting more interested in it. But getting out there, using your freedoms against them, you have free reign in this country. Stand there like that old person. You know, like, what's this? What's that? What are you doing there? You know, bring a camera. Make it known. Use YouTube. Use your media. We have to do what they did to us. You take back the media. You take back TV. And through them using military and stuff, as soon as I saw some of the movies coming out with us, that's the government takeover of Hollywood, is it not? You don't demonize Hollywood, you give them blockbusters, you give them heroes. And they were under orders to do it. So, taking back the, the, the input, everyone now, even kids, are on receive. There is no transmit, there is no genesis of thought. Shut off all the power. I saw my nieces, my twin nieces, they were coming home, they had a rolling blackout in New York. They came back within an hour and a half. They didn't have their SMS, their TV, their Nintendos, their uh, all the things that they have. It's all input. It's all input. Read a book. You'll start feeling your mind move again. <laughs> We've gotten away from those things. Yeah. So it's, we have, to, we have to be able to think for ourselves. Get away from some of your media because it's those little drips that just, that Saul Alin, that do the Saul Alinsky and Cass Sunstinian techniques against you to push you. You know, ah, that's okay, that's okay. That, no, it's not. And you have to be that stick in the mud. You have to stand for what you believe on a basic level. Yes, we can do all this organizations and stuff, but you have to stand for yourself. You have to know who you are. So what can you do? That's the question. Ben, one of the questions that uh, <clears throat> that was put to me in the back uh, that I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to, but I uh, thought since you've recently gotten out of the military, you may have a better feeling for. Um, I, I mentioned uh, in my presentation this fellow Abdurrahman Alamudi, uh, who recruited Grover Norquist. Um, one of the things that he was enabled to do before he did that under the Carter, excuse me, the Clinton administration was he was given the responsibility for selecting, training, and credentialing chaplains for the United States military and the U.S. prison system. Uh, the question that was put to me was, um, there are reports that uh, some of our troops are uh, converting to Islam in the course of their deployments or maybe after they come home. 
uh, presumably, uh, if if being ministered to by Abdurrahman al uh, Muslim Brotherhood cohort, uh, that's not uh, going to be the more benign form of Islam. Did you see this in the ranks? Uh, is it something that you were concerned about or that we should be concerned about? No. I'm not saying it's not happening, but I'm just saying I, the guys I was with, I, we know what we fight for. Mm. There is a the youth, the younger people, they're not being taught to stand on their oath to protect and defend the Constitution. You don't have a president to give you an orders without the Constitution. You do not have an officer duly appointed above you to give you anything if there is no Constitution. If you don't know what it is. I'm not saying I didn't, I'm, I'm saying I didn't see it. I'm not saying that it wasn't there because not understanding it, it is absolutely there. Probably within 23 to 24 years old down, have lost all sense, and they are ready to go. If you know, it, this ideology goes to a smash them, crash them, violent nature. It gives you a religious reason to be pious on killing people. And you know, you don't believe what I believe, you die. Oh my God, I like all you women. You're mine. You know, it's it's. It goes to the dreg, and we've uneducated ourselves for that to take place there. And if you look at one world government, would Christianity be okay in a one world government, or would Islam be perfect for a one world government? Well, they, they have a certain view on that. Yes. Hank, oh, did you want to say something on this? Uh, if so, I'd, I'd like you also to address one other thing. Um, I have been hearing from uh, Avi Schnur, one of our colleagues, uh, and others who've been working in the effort to harden our grid against electromagnetic pulse, either of the naturally occurring kind or the man-caused kind, uh, that it might cost as much as a billion dollars to protect the grid of the United States against the kind of catastrophic effects you've talked about. Uh, that doesn't seem like a lot of money. Uh, needless to say, um, is that a correct appreciation of the magnitude of what needs to be done here? Uh, is it greater or less? I, th I think that a, a billion dollars is in line with what the commission recommended for a, a comprehensive fix. Um, and, and that's a billion dollars over a period of time. I don't remember whether it was a decade or, or five years or 15 years. But just to put it in perspective, when I ran the SDI program, I was managing a $5 billion a year program. Um, and the kind of fix that I was talking about for the um, Gulf Coast would be on the order of a billion dollars for maybe uh, two or three sites. Uh, I believe that's a, a reasonably accurate uh, representation. And uh, no, that's not a lot of money. Uh, we're spending on the order of a trillion dollars these days in defense overall and providing for the, uh, you know, common defense at home. Seems like to me that spending a pittance on that is, is a reasonable thing. The estimate I gave you, 20 cents annually per, per uh, subscriber in the elect electric uh, power business uh, is trivial. One of the political issues I gather that's been going on is whether or not that's a tax that comes from the government or it's passed through to the subscriber. You know, uh, how many of you would be willing to pay 20 cents a year <laughs> to protect the grid? I mean, so suppose it's wrong by a factor of 100 and it's $20 a year. I mean, give me a break. Uh, and yet, the powers that be in our Congress have stalled this now for five years. Five years. Well, the companies, uh, they should do it on their own if you can figure out how to get to them. I mentioned FERC, the federal, I don't know all these acronyms, federally um, so electric, electric regulatory, uh, like regulatory commission is all in favor of doing this. There's something called the NERC which is the one that's creating the problem, and I gather it's the commercial side. And they, through their lobbyists in Washington, <laughs> have managed to stagnate you know, the powers that be there. And it's absurd. It really is absurd. It's just one of many things of that sort that demonstrate you know, how, how um, screwed up things are in Washington.
Can I can I just mention in this regard? This this happens to be a passion of mine too, and I'm really grateful to Hank for his leadership on it. Um, because most of the private sector operates, not surprisingly, in a for-profit mode, and since much of what they are worrying about in terms of the quarterly bottom line is whether they are going to be able to show their shareholders that they've turned a profit, even what seem to be fairly marginal costs to them are not likely to be things that they're going to, you know, anxiously and aggressively pursue. So it takes pressure. And pressure coming from people like yourselves, maybe your shareholders, at least your, your consumers of their services, and I think them hearing from you would, would make a big difference. I know there are a number of you who want to ask questions, and I'm not allowed to do that. We're almost out of time. I'm going to give Tom the last word. I've got it just, just for equity's sake. Tom, um, I want to ask you about the importance, as you see it, working on the grassroots level of the kinds of initiatives that uh, we've been talking with Al Clements about in terms of American laws for American courts and other legislative initiatives that, that people in states like this can help get done. How important is that in the fight? Yeah, American laws for American courts. And um, you can go to Center for Security Policy to uh, link to that. It's, it doesn't include the word Sharia, but uh, one of the focuses, foci of that is to stop Islamic law from insinuating itself here. Critically important because as we've laid out today and as the book that you're going to buy details, the civilization jihad has a plan to slowly um, develop enclaves like in London and in Paris and these other places, Islamic enclaves, which then necessarily need Islamic law for adjudication. This American law for American courts and your state senator right here is going to be leading the charge in this state, is critically important as a prophylactic against the beginning of the end of American jurisprudential activity, as these guys wrote about. Thank you very much. We're going to see you downstairs. We're going to have lunch. Oh, wait. Thank you. I, I want to insist on one moment. One moment. One I last insist word. on it. As I look around this room, I, I see some folk with less hair than I, and some that isn't white, and so on. I don't see many young people. And I think that is a serious, serious, serious problem that we have. And we need to give due interest to bringing young folk on board. I'm delighted my son's taking, taking an interest in this. But we need to go a generation beyond him. We need to get to his kids. Yep. Thank each and every one of you for being here. Joe has asked me to uh, let you know that lunch is being served in the room where we had breakfast. We're gonna start back here immediately at 1.15. And the one thing that I would ask you is to come to the front of the room and take up some of the